Bruce Robinson, the fucker who wrote that part, is a sadist. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I told him that I was allergic to alcohol when I'd finally been told I got the part after two weeks of auditions. And he said, you've got to have a physical, he, he, said, he came with this phrase, he said, you've got to have a chemical memory of what it's like to be absolutely arsehole. Mm. So he sent me home on the penultimate day of rehearsals and made me drink a bottle of champagne that I was given and I stayed up through the night vomiting and drinking, vomiting and drinking until eventually I was completely drunk. And then they picked me up and took me to Shepparton Studios the next morning. And I got there early and Paul McGann, who played the other part, and Bruce hadn't arrived yet. And they'd left a wet bar of vodka and various things out. So I filled a tumbler of glass with vodka then topped it off with Pepsi Cola, I think it was. <laughs> Drank that down in one, thinking, fuck, if I'm not drunk enough, maybe, maybe I will be now. <laughs> and then, because we did do rehearsals for two weeks, I knew the script by that point, and got uh, about halfway through the script, and just remember that there were French doors at the end of this um, <laughs> rehearsal room, and I knew that I had to get out, and opened the doors, and a Persian carpet came out of my mouth, and I passed out. Well, how? <laughs> and woke up 24 hours later at home in my bed, and a doctor said to me, you could have died from this, so yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm here to tell the tale. You suffer for your art, quite literally. Now, that, uh, that movie has been voted in various surveys uh, uh, a favourite of actors and drug addicts. What are some of... <laughs> when people stop you and speak to you about that, what are some of the most memorable things that people have said to you about your performance in that film? Um... Well, because it has this ongoing cult following as a result of DVD and uh, video previously in England, um, there's not a day that I'm on a bus or the tube or subway or whatever, um, certainly in England, where somebody will shout out a line that is appropriate to a circumstance from that film. So I've had everything from Monty, you terrible, to <laughs> Scrubbers, to we've gone on holiday by mistake, or I've been in a restaurant, somebody said, we want the finest wines available to humanity. I mean, this there seems to be a line that fits from ever. And then, of course, the people who are 99% of the planet who've never seen or heard of this film go, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> yes. So, you know, it's, that's how it's been. How did that movie change your life, Richard? Completely and utterly, because... Uh, when it, was, when it was made in 1986, in the summer of 86, I can remember the, the, the people saying that the title was unpronounceable, there were no women in it, no car chases, no special effects, and no, no people that anybody had ever heard of before. So it then got released at the Carnegie Cinema, I think, on the Upper East side, West Side, mm -hmm. um, for a short amount of time in in that year, in 87, and I got a call from the late, great Arnold Copelson, mm -hmm. who said, Sean Connery has turned down this part, Michael Douglas has turned down this part, you know, would you come and meet Steve Miner at some fancy hotel in Park Lane in London to play this 18th century warlock mm -hmm. in a movie called Warlock? Mm -hmm. So um, I came and that was my first job in, in L.A. Mm -hmm. and had the byline, he came from the past to destroy the future. <laughs> <laughs> Warlock. So, <laughs> not my greatest outing. <laughs> but it's my first job here and I thought I'd never, you know, I had no idea that I'd ever worked because mm -hmm. when I went to see the, um, the first cut of the film in Soho with my wife who's here today, um, I drew blood on her wrist because I was so horrified by what I'd done in the film. And I asked Bruce afterwards, in a terrible state, I said, um, please take the money that you've paid for me back. I'm so sorry I've ruined your film and blah, blah, blah. I was absolutely convinced I'd never work again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I've always thought that it's disingenuous when actors say that they don't like watching themselves, but I think it's the equivalent of either hearing your voice back on a recording mm -hmm. or, unless you're a voyeur, watching yourself having sex. It's the doing of it that you want to do, but watching the playback, you go, fuck, is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it still feels like. But it was the first in a string of Hollywood movies. You did so much, everything from The Player to Hudson Hawk. Um, but I want to ask you about... You uh, fucker. A particular <laughs> favourite. <laughs> I want to ask you about a particular favourite LA story. Uh, yeah. You and Steve Martin are so great on screen. What was your relationship like off screen? Uh, we fell in love. Mm. And uh, no, uh, he, he had come to see How to Get Ahead in Advertising um, in London. 
uh, because he was married to an English actor called Victoria Tennant, and she knew Sophie Robinson, who was married to Bruce Robinson. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the, the uh, screening of the movie, he said, oh, I've got a part in a movie that I've written called L.A. Story. Would you be free to do it? So I thought, well, that's talk. It mm -hmm. never would happen. And then it did, and I'd been told how arctic and unsociable and unapproachable he was as a person. And I then arrived here, I think it was in 1990, and I, got a, I was staying in the Chateau Marmot, I got a phone call saying, what are you doing for breakfast? It's Steve. And I said, oh, nothing. So he said, he gave me the address on Bedford Drive where he used to live. And I went and he had this big swivel swing door that pivoted on a, I'd never seen a door like that in a mm -hmm. house before. And he had this art gallery-like house with de Kooning paintings and all this stuff all on the walls, which I was flabbergasted by. And he had a crate of aqua libra, which at that time was non-alcoholic drink mm -hmm. that cost a fortune that I think had been made in England. And he said, you know, have a glass of this. So he was instantly friendly and we stayed friends for the last 30 years. And he told me the other day that he's got um, a sort of Bible thick load of faxes was, was pre-email um, of my outpourings that we've had between the two of us. And I said, you can never, ever publish these because I will be eviscerated. He said, ah, I've got them. So we've stayed, we've stayed friends all these years. Excellent. Which in Hollywood is, in my experience, is unusual because every time I've come back here to work or to visit or whatever, anybody's phone numbers that I had no, are no longer exist. And mm. I think just the nature of the profession, profession is that you have this sort of holiday romance type experience working with people very intently. And then you think, I think, that I'm going to see them again, and then mm -hmm. you, you don't. Mm -hmm. So to have friendships that have survived that, um, like Steve, has been a great bonus. L.A. Story gave one view of Hollywood, another was provided by The Player. You, you've worked with some great directors. What was the experience like working with Bob Altman? He was the best of the best because mm -hmm. he, he loved actors for a start. He was incredibly loyal. I worked with him three times. And even though Ready to Wear Stroke, um, Pret a Porto, the second film that I did with him, was a critical and financial disaster, the experience of making it was exactly the same in that it's a very democratic process akin to working in a, um, a theater company because everybody is treated the same. You basically get the same money. Um, it's the only time I've ever been the same money as Julia Roberts. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you queue up in a marquee for, you know, if Lauren McCall is in front of you having a makeup done, Sophia Loren is waiting behind her. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, if those people are waiting, then there's no room for anybody to, there was only one actor, and I won't say who she was. Um, she was the only one that required a bodyguard and wouldn't have her makeup done with everybody else and just didn't enter into the spirit of what it was and then realized how isolating that, that experience was for her. But essentially, he, he gave you a free-for-all to, to work and certainly on Gosford Park in particular, even though we had this very um, you know, Oscar-winning script by Julian Fellows, he encouraged people to improvise around that and he would have two cameras going at the same time and even if they crossed over each other and you'd see a camera coming to shot in the rushes, um, the beauty of that was that you never ever, there was never a moment where it was Sandra, it's on your close-ups, and the other person can kind of take a holiday or not even be there for the reverses. You, you always, you, you were part of an ensemble and that you had to stay completely in your character and it meant that y you stay in the world of w what you're pretending to be rather than that sort of stop star that is common to almost every film I've ever been in where you, 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 know, you can have a continuity person reading in the other parts when it's coverage on, on one, one actor if the other actor chooses not to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you would think that that would be the norm in the way films are made, but the way that Altman did that was unusual. And the other thing that he did that I thought was absolutely brilliant, and when I wrote and directed my own film, I did the exact same thing. He invited all the actors to see the Rushes or the Dailies every evening. So that um, he said, you know, a lot of the stuff that you do will be cut, but at least you, the actors, and the crew will have had the opportunity to see the work that you've done once. 
and so it, is, it, it has had an audience and been known. And of course, the other thing which was so clever about what he did is that it helped him edit because he could then see, he could feel an audience reaction. Because if you had 10 takes of something, you know communally, instantly, which is the one that's going to work. And you get that visceral reaction from, from people, albeit biased because they're in the, involved in the making of it. But I think that really helped. And the other thing that he did was had dope every night. And because I'm allergic to alcohol, I love that. <laughs> um, and he always employed musicians, Lyle Lovett or whoever they were, so that on a Sunday night when you were on location and had a party, there was free entertainment. Oh. I thought, you know, just these simple things he did. And um, he also liked actors that had long faces and were very tall and, you know, uh, pipe cleaner shaped as I am. Yes. So I'm very grateful to that for Bob. Francis Ford Coppola, magnificent eccentric. What was your experience with him? I'd gone from being on Dracula with him and then immediately afterwards with the same DOP, the late Michael Bauhaus, to do Age of Innocence, a small part in that in New York. Mm -hmm. And I thought these are the two great American directors that I had absolutely idolized when I was a teenager and a drama student in the 70s. And the best way to describe how Francis worked was he initially had rehearsals at his Napa Valley estate where there was the desk from The Godfather and the boat from Apocalypse Now in this big warehouse mm -hmm. when we were rehearsing, which for me as a movie geek was just, I felt like I sort of arrived where the ruby slippers were kind oh. of feeling. <laughs> and we also filmed at the um, Sony o old MGM studios where in the pool that had been opened up where Esther Williams did all her stuff. And in a city where, no disrespect, but the history of who's gone before is not really present. I mean, there are not many pictures or statues of Charlie Chaplin around. I know that Marilyn Monroe's outside the Four Seasons Hotel, but in terms of the history that's here, it seems it, it does get sort of erased very, very quickly. Um, so having a sense of history in that studio was extraordinary. But to go back to what I was saying about Francis is that uh, during the rehearsals, and we were all staying at his Napa Valley estate, I said, how do you cook for 30, 40 people every night? He said, that's the only way I know how to cook, because I can't cook for two people. Yeah. And that, I thought, was a great metaphor for how Francis works, because during the shooting bit, there were friends, family, visitors, dogs, <laughs> parakeets, <laughs> music playing. It was a sort of ringmaster of semi-organized chaos in which he worked. So you felt that anything was possible. I remember Carrie Elwes coming in one day and saying, I think I should be eating in the scene. And he went to the props department and turned up with 30 drumsticks. <laughs> and Francis said, Fuck, we don't want that going in the middle of the scene. This is about vampires and you're taking it seriously. So they went. So that, my point is that all of that was sort of encouraged, allowed and accommodated. In complete contrast to the Scorsese film. And I don't know whether it was particular to him doing this you know, very effete, stylized world of Edith Wharton, high society, turn of the century New Yorkers. But he worked in monastic silence. And I said to Michael Bauhaus, is it always like this? He said, oh, yes, it's always very, very respectful mm. and very quiet and all along. And I think that was a German accent via <laughs> Poland. Anyway, he, he, because there was an occasion where somebody whispered and Scorsese, you know, he just absolutely blew gaskets. And I thought, so it was a very, it felt very formal and monastic. That's the best way I can describe it, in complete contrast to Coppola's, you know, three ring circus. Mm -hmm. Having worked with all these great directors, uh, you then uh, direct your own movie, Wawa. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn from them that you wanted to put into practice when you got the chance? Well, all the things that Altman taught me um, as much as possible and allowing actors to improvise things. I mean, there was a scene, because it was entirely autobiographical, about my very dysfunctional childhood in Swaziland, where I grew up. Um, there was a scene where the Gabriel Byrne, who was playing my father, I had scripted dialogue between him and Emily Watson, who played my American stepmother. Um, and they were listening to a recording of, they were listening to, to Julian and Sandy, the um, round the horn things on the, mm -hmm. on the radio. And there was dialogue that was in that. And when Emily and Gabriel started doing this scene where he had had a brain hemorrhage and you knew that he had weeks to live, and Nicholas Holt was playing me as a 14-year-old, um, 
they did it in a way that Emily said, she said, no disrespect, but do you mind that we don't do any of the words that you've written here because what's going on between us is much more powerful? And I said, yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. of course. And as soon as I saw it on the monitor and the rushes, it was a hundred times better than anything that I could have written. So that's just an example, I think, of just when actors, my respect for actors was so increased by that experience because what they offer up and what they're willing to just just do and to try out is so emotionally unchecked, if you like. Um, and that I feel really in debt for them having done that. Mm -hmm. So when actors, you know, when actors are attacked or they said, oh, they're, they're uncooperative or they're bitchy or they're this or whatever, things that are very often labeled at them or they're called lovies or whatever, wh whatever that is. Um, in my experience, almost without exception, people are, ve you, you have to collaborate and to react and listen to other people. So you notice and actors talk about the people that are the exceptions to that. So people have been complete assholes mm -hmm. are the people that unite you uh, in the same way that actors remember their bad reviews. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really common. That movie was such a, a fascinating glimpse of your childhood. How has growing up in Swaziland shaped and continues to shape your worldview? Oh, I think it's a great quote from Kipling. Uh, how can he, England, know who only knows England? And I think that because of where I grew up, you know, there were snakes in the bottom of the garden and monkeys, and you, you just took that as that was the way that your life was. It was only when I emigrated to England at the age of 25, 1982, did I realize in retrospect, and when I told people, people asked me about my child, and I said, yeah, well, my father was an alcoholic and you know, tried to shoot me when I was 15 because I emptied his crate of scotch as though that was a perfectly reasonable <laughs> argument why somebody should try and shoot you at point blank range and miss because they were too pissed. Um, and it was only through the prism of other people's viewpoints that I then realized, oh well, may, and I kept being told you should write your story or you should make a movie about your story. So I eventually acted upon that. Um, unfortunately, when it got released in America, it was, promoted as a Mother's Day light comedy. Huh. And the first scene is Nicholas Holt, well, is me at the age of 10, waking up in the back seat of a car, seeing my mother, played by Miranda Richardson, fucking my father's best friend on the front seat, which I wasn't supposed to see, which began my diary writing. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> it didn't really fit the Mother's Day mm. expectations in the Milwaukee Mall, <laughs> where people thought, mm, I'm gonna take my mother to see this. Yes. You're a great uh, diarist. We've loved your books. Are there more stories in you that you want to tell for the screen? Yes, always yes. And um, the, the reason I haven't published a second set of uh, film diaries is because I thought that the trajectory of going from being with Nell and I in 1986, having never done a movie before, and the sort of wide eyed in Babylon of that, coming to LA and doing Warlock, the first experience of being in LA on a studio picture, and then going through this whole ga gamut of that over, over 20 years, to then do more seemed to me, it's, how do you tell a story that doesn't have a kind of ingenue beginning with a more cynical end? Um, or seasoned veteran, as I'm now referred to on Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, veteran character actor. So I don't know, but I, but I also see the, the, the value now of, of how the industry has changed so much and just the sort of the peaks and troughs that happen to a character actor's career might be of interest at some future point. But I don't know, between Steve's fax collection and my emails, I don't know. I might, I might be violently sued by people in this very room. I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> as you can tell, I'm not, I'm not very good at um, diplomacy. Thank you, diplomacy <laughs> from the front row. Yeah, what comes into my head, I'm afraid, doesn't really get too filtered what comes out of my mouth. So I've landed myself in you know, trouble for that. Um, we've talked a lot today about your film work um, on TV. Um, you've been part of such great franchises as uh, Doctor Who and Game of Thrones. As a seasoned veteran actor, how do you feel about the state of television today and how exciting is it um, as a, as a uh, primarily film actor to see what's happening in TV? Golden age. Mm -hmm. I think it's an absolutely golden age in that 
I can remember as a, t as a teenager in the 70s thinking that Altman Coppola and Scorsese were the sort of triptych of people that I thought were absolutely astonishingly brilliant, you know, post Kubrick. And then when Star Wars, which I'm currently in the ninth episode of um, filming, when that came out in 77 and Jaws in 75 or 76, those tentpole movies and the whole way that movies were marketed changed, you know, irrevocably. So I think that that feeling that I had of seeing those Bob Fosse and Scorsese and all the movies I've just mentioned, um, Robert Towns, Chinatown and that stuff in the early 70s, that seems to me almost the equivalent of what we've got in television now, that this long form means that the best writers and the best actors and directors have migrated to television in a way that I think would have been inconceivable 10 years ago. And I give you an example. When I was on Hudson Hawk, um, <laughs> Bruce Willis had, had irked the profession in that he'd gone from being a huge television star in Moonlighting to then getting a three picture deal and becoming a movie star with Die Hard 1 and 2 and his salary went off the chart. And there was, there was a real perception, I can remember it so clearly being here, um, of going, what, how the hell does a TV actor cross over and do that? Whereas now the reverse is happening, mm -hmm. that you have really great actors. It's not because they're in the twilight of their career, on the, on the twilight zone of their career, but you have absolutely brilliant people who are doing television because I think very often the roles are great and the writing is so good. So, you know, I watched Breaking Bad, for instance. My wife had had minor surgery for something and we were at home and I think we watched Breaking Bad in five days flat all the way through. And, you know, similarly with The Crown and Fowder, the Israeli-Palestinian series and you know, up, down and sideways, there's so many that I can think of. So I feel very passionately about how, how good that is. Mm. And what's so unusual about this Can You Ever Forgive Me movie is that time and again from all the screens that we've had when it first launched at Telluride a month ago and then in New York and LA and the feedback that we keep having from the reviews that we've had is that it has somehow invoked that indie spirit of, this, of the early 70s movies that I was talking about where something doesn't have special effects, you are watching characters and you go on paper, who is going to watch a curmudgeonly lesbian, a reprobate, dying of AIDS gay guy who are on a kind of road movie through Manhattan mm -hmm. from bar, shop, you know, bar to bookshop to bedsit kind of thing and that it's about loneliness and isolation and people finding friendship in the middle of that. You, on paper, you go, who the fuck is going to go and watch that? Mm -hmm. But what, what was palpable for Melissa and I when we saw it for the first time at four o'clock in the afternoon with an audience in Telluride is that people kept coming up to us and saying, this movie made us feel something. Acting for a large part is waiting for people to pass you the ball and then you can put it in the goal. When you get offered this part of Jack Hawk and Can You Ever Forgive Me, with all the other great parts you have played, yeah. I, I imagine it must have seemed like a, a gift better than any Christmas. Can you take us back to the first time you read that script and how that emotionally affected you reading that character? Yeah, it was, it was in November, exactly two years ago this month, that my English agent Sue, my only agent, Sue Latimer, um, called me up and said, or emailed me and said, you have 24 hours to read this script and make, and make a decision. And I immediately said, what, is it like Mission Impossible? Is it gonna blow up? <laughs> and, they, and she said, no, no, no. And then I said, being paranoid, I said, well, who's dropped out or who's dropped dead? She said, don't answer that. Don't ask yourself that question. It doesn't matter. Um, and so I read it and I admired Marielle Heller's Diary of a Teenage Girl enormously. I knew Jeff Whitty's scripts from um, Avenue Q, the musical, and Nicole Holof Center, the, the co-writer. Um, and then I saw there was Melissa McCarthy playing this other, you know, playing the lead role. And it was, you know, a slam dunk of just saying yes immediately because the, the part was so good. And what I've always thought of pro probably, you know, going back to your question earlier about how does your worldview get affected by where you grew up? I always think of people as animals when I meet them of 
just thinking, am I dealing with a predator or, f you know, what's, am I going to be eaten alive or what am I dealing with here? <laughs> um, so Jack Hawk seemed to me like a Labrador in that he will go up to anybody to shag them, to lick them, to <laughs> schmooze them, you know, anything to lick them into submission, if you like, <laughs> and an act of friendliness, you know, yeah. fearlessly so. Whereas uh, Lee Israel, especially as played by Ms. McCarthy, is such a porcupine of uh, prickly and private, and even if you get close, you still get stung um, by that. And I thought that was such a great combination of, of two characters, of how they form this relationship. And then the other thing was to think of movie equivalents, and I thought of Midnight Cowboy as Joe Buck and Ratso, this most unlikely friendship between two essential losers in New York where you're surrounded by such wealth and sheer numbers of human beings, but you're so utterly isolated and codependent. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, Neil Simon, brilliant script of Odd Couple where you've got people that should never be together, but <laughs> somehow they are. So you have this, this oddball platonic relationship between mm -hmm. them. So, and that's how it came to be. And then uh, I arrived here, I arrived in Manhattan in January last year in the, in the middle of winter and on a Wednesday for costume and uh, hair tests and stuff. And I said, when is Melissa going to be here? And they said, oh no, she's only coming on Friday for costume and hair fittings. You will only meet her on Monday when we start shooting. And I said to Marielle, you have no idea the level of my paranoia. I won't, I won't stay, I will be awake for 72 hours yeah. by Monday morning if I haven't met her. So mercifully, Melissa had the exact same impulse and we met on a Friday. She carved out some time out of what they were doing, all the tests on her. And we met and it took about three nanoseconds to realize that we were on the same page as it were about what direction these, how these characters would, would be played and that we just got on so instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, and that is, you know, somebody said to me during the making of Withnail, uh, ironically, when we were making it up a mountainside in Cumbria, uh, people on the crew said, we know that this is your first movie, but we can tell you that for most of us who are veterans of making movies on the crew, that is, they said the experience of what you are going through on this is so unique and you will only realize that in retrospect. And almost in the, ex the same way, 32 years later, that is the feeling that we had on, can you ever forgive me, that mm -hmm. a feeling of a confluence of people, subject matter, and this invisible thing called luck where in the zeitgeist of the time, you have a female-centric uh, cast and crew, producer, co-writer, and 28 days of shooting that then has this result that you have so loved doing, and you hope that that transmits and finds an audience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mercifully, this, this one seems to have done so. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a bonus when you have something mm -hmm. that... You know, I did a film with Julie Waters that, and Denham Elliott that was an absolute disaster, but the, the, the joy of making it was enormous and the friendships mm -hmm. that it resulted in. So when you get a good experience of making it plus the critical result at the other end, that's a sort of double bonus. Mm -hmm. And that's what this feels like. The joy in your work has really come through today. As you um, mentioned earlier, you'll next be seen in Star Wars Episode Nine. How do you reflect on going from a mountainside in Cumbria to a galaxy far, far away? I mean, that's quite a journey as an actor. Well, I'm gonna take a long way of answering your question. When I was, when I was finishing drama school, um, I got an assessment at the end from the drama professor, which, you know, they, they feel obliged to do. And he looked at me as a man called Professor Moore, who's now dead. And you'll understand why I said it like that. He said, he said look, you know, you've written and directed stuff um, in your four years here. You are going to, I think you'll have a career as a director. You're too weird looking to make it as an actor. And you're too lightweight, you know, he gave all this stuff. And he said, you're lantern jawed, sepulchral face, tombstone featured. You're just not going to do it. And I was kept thinking, well, Donald Sutherland's very tall and he has a long face and he's an actor, so fuck it. Um, so, 
and all the reviews that first came out of Whistnail in 1987 described me as all the things that <laughs> this <laughs> professor had said. But I thought, well, I've got, I've got the part. So that any of this has happened, because again, where I grew up, in 1969, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, you know, took those historic steps, and I had said to my parents, I would like to be a professional actor when I grew up, when I was 12. It was as ludicrous then as saying, like all the kids in my class were, that you know, I wanted to be an astronaut, because it seemed so impossible. Um, and the fact that it's happened, that I've had this career as long as it, it, it has been and seems to be ongoing, is I still can't really believe it. And I would look at my diary and I think, oh yeah, I was at the Hollywood thing this morning at uh, Dalam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then it seems real. Mm -hmm. But right now it doesn't, it feels like this has happened to somebody else. We're so excited, uh, <laughs> genuinely, to have you here at BAFTA Los Angeles. Richard E. Grant, everybody! Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>